John Seeger is the president and CEO of Population Connection, the preeminent grassroots group committed to educating the next generation about the challenges posed by global population growth and advocating for federal programs to help ensure that every woman and every couple have access to affordable voluntary contraception. John has been a guest lecturer at more than 50 colleges, including MIT, Duke, Middlebury, Purdue, UCLA, University of Pennsylvania, Brandeis, etc., and has spoken to numerous environmental, religious, and community groups all across the United States, including the American Humanist Association. He was a featured speaker at one of our uh, events um, during one of our national conferences. And he speaks about the environmental and human costs of rapid population growth. He was appointed to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency by the Clinton administration and also served as Chief of Staff for U.S. Representative Peter H. Kosmeyer, a senior member of the House Interior and Foreign Affairs Committee. A veteran of more than 50 political campaigns, John has authored numerous op-eds and articles on various aspects of population growth. He holds a bachelor's degree in political science from Trinity College in Hartford, Connecticut. Please help me welcome our speaker, John Seeger. Thank you so much. Before I forget, so I don't forget, if anybody would like more information about what we're doing, uh, my sneaky attempt to get names. Feel free to sign up and give your email address if, if you'd like to. Uh, I, <laughs> no, they've got other methods to keep track of you. <laughs> everything, everything, everything does. That's right. Uh, so yeah, we are Population Connection. Some of you may know us uh, by our uh, uh, our uh, maiden name, <laughs> Zero Population Growth, or ZPG. We were founded back in 1968, actually just down the road from here. Uh, and what happened was, uh, imagine you work in a publishing house, uh, and you're a junior person, and your job is to review unsolicited manuscripts. And they just come in by in droves. And you're trying to just sort them and find the ones that you can pass up the line that look like they might be big sellers. And you get a book from a, a professor who's an expert in butterflies. And he writes a book about population. I don't know that you would have passed it up the line, frankly. But that's exactly what Paul Ehrlich did in 1968. He wrote a book called The Population Bomb, which went on to sell 3 million copies, which is pretty darn impressive. I've read that the average nonfiction book sells maybe 500 to 1,000 copies. Incidentally, for those of you who remember that, Paul Ehrlich did not write The Population Bomb. And he will admit that somewhat shamefacedly. Uh, he and his wife Anne co-wrote it, but the publisher said at the time, "Oh, we don't need her name on it." So, and he's been embarrassed about it ever since. So, and he's done his best to correct that particular record. So, we were founded as Zero Population Growth, and and the movement took off like wildfire, especially on hundreds of campuses around the country. And so, somebody needed to keep track of it, and so that's how the organization itself got formed in response to grassroots interest. About 15 years ago, we changed our name to Population Connection because the old name seemed to scare the children a little bit. There's something about zero population. They don't always hear the third word that worries some people. And so we went out to look for a new name. And we sat down with our members, because all our support comes from our wonderful 40,000 members around the country. And we asked them. Not, we didn't ask them if, about changing the name, because that's like hitting a hornet's nest on a hot day, if you ask people that. Uh, we asked them why they cared about population. And what they told us time and again was because it connects with other things they care about. It connects with poverty and social justice and the environment and civil strife and the economy. And so we thought that's not the worst idea for a name, so we changed it. And we don't really know what that nice little thing is over there, but it looks friendly. And we figured it's good to have a friendly thing up there. There we are, by the way. Population is the story of us. So I wanted to get a group photo. Uh, I didn't actually get it taken. This was taken back at the behest of the late, great Carl Sagan. Uh, he asked uh, NASA to uh, have a satellite look back. And that's about the last moment he could have looked back, because that, that little tiny dot there is one pixel. 
That's one pixel in that picture. By the way, in a separate picture one time when a scientist was talking about a faraway galaxy or some such thing he'd found and he was showing a picture like this, he said, how did you find it? He said, it was easy. It had a big red arrow pointing to it. Uh, but, but the arrow was added. But that, that's, well, for those of us who were around back in 1980, that's all of us. As Carl Sagan said, and I won't read that wonderful quote of his, but I'll just allude to it, it's everybody we've ever cared about. It's everybody we've ever loved. Everything that ever mattered to us is on that one little dot, that one little dot in, in the vastness of space. Some people would say this is an accurate picture of planet Earth. Now that our uh, president is traveling, maybe he'll... Sometimes when you travel, you learn things. I'm an, I try to be an optimist. I'm not wildly optimistic about him learning that. But, uh, but nonetheless, some people seem to think that's an accurate p depiction of planet Earth. I think it, it leaves a few things out that, that need to be noted. I want to tell you a little story. I want to tell you a story about a woman I work with. She doesn't work for us. We work in partnership with her. Her name's Lisa Shannon. About a dozen years ago, Lisa was lying on her sofa watching Oprah. And the show that day was about a terrible but a very important subject, rape as an instrument of war in the Congo and elsewhere. Lisa had no connection with this. She's just watching TV. It just hit her that she had to do something. Well, Lisa's a runner, so she decided to do a 30K solo run and ask people to sponsor her per, per kilometer. And she raised some money. Well, she didn't stop. She started organizing race after race with more and more people around the country. She quit her job. She dumped her fiancé, which I should ask her about sometime. And, and she devoted herself for the next 10 years to this basically couch surfing with friends. Lisa raised $14 million to help women in the Congo and elsewhere who were victims of rape. $14 million because she got off that sofa. And recently, we asked Lisa uh, to travel to the Congo on our behalf and to other countries. Because what Lisa came to realize after a few years of, after years of this, that she was getting national attention, but she realized that the real people who mattered, the people whose stories had moved her so much, weren't really the focus. The focus was on her. And she wanted the focus to be on them. And so we asked her to go over to Africa recently and collect some stories about people in terms of the impact of what is now happening under this current administration. And if the technical gods are on our side, there's a very brief video about that. Wakanzambi <laughs> In the country, don't agree with abortion, even in case of rape. They arrive here at the hospital bleeding, in strokes, with uh, severe infection because they tried to make abortion illegally. The whole number of uh, survivors, women survivors that we receive at the hospital, per month we have like 20 or 25 among them who, are, who have a pregnancy with, as a result of a rape.
Hi, I'm Lisa Shannon, and I've been on the ground in Africa looking at the impact of U.S. policy on women and girls. So I'm just urging everyone to uh, absolutely ardently oppose cuts to family planning that the U.S. is proposing. It, it's going to cost hundreds of thousands of lives and support the Global HER Act that would permanently repeal the global gag rule uh, so that health providers are um, able to respond to the needs of patients rather than the ideology of policymakers who really don't have a clue the life and death stakes uh, on the ground. Thanks. I, I've shown this video in recent uh, weeks to students all across the country from NYU to UCLA and uh, I'm a pretty upbeat person and I just get angry every time I show it and uh, I don't really try to reconcile that anger with my general demeanor. I just recognize that there are things in life you should be angry about and it's what you do about it that matters. It's what you do with that, with that anger and how you channel it into something positive, hopefully. There is a lot going on. On the first business day of the Trump administration on Monday, uh, Trump signed something called a global gag rule. Here he is signing it, surrounded by seven women. But wait, no, I guess the women weren't there that day. Seven men. Uh, and so what is a global gag rule? Well, let's turn to Sean Spicer for that. Here's what Sean told us that day. This is a transcript from the White House press conference. He referred to the Mexico City policy, which is the same thing as the global gag rule, just two different names for the same thing. He said it will end the use of taxpayer dollars to fund abortions overseas. That's what Sean told us, which raises a perfectly reasonable question. Over the past 40 years, how many abortions overseas has the U.S. government funded? Does anybody know? Yes. That's right. That's right, Dave. It's zero. None. This is a solution in search of a problem, uh, which you wouldn't think you'd need because there are so many real problems in this world. In fact, there's been a law in the book since 1973 called the Helms Amendment. Maybe a few of you remember the late unlamented Jesse Helms. And uh, this says that no US funds can be used internationally to perform abortion. Personally, I think we should fund it as part of our foreign aid, but we don't. And nobody has ever suggested this law has been violated. So somehow Sean got the facts wrong, shocking though that may be to people. Uh, but here's what happened with the global gag rule. If it doesn't ban uh, funding for abortions, because there is no such thing in terms of US foreign aid, here's what it does. Imagine you run a family planning clinic in Nepal, and you get some US funds for family planning. But you, consistent with your laws of your country, do perform abortions. If you do that, not with US funds, that would be <coughs> illegal and nobody does it, you would, lose your, you would lose your US funding if you use other money for that. Let's say you don't do that, but a woman comes in who's a victim of rape and they, you say, well, we don't, we don't actually provide abortions here, but there's a clinic 20 miles away you can go to. You can't do that or you lose your funding. Let's say you don't do that, but your government, the Nepalese government, asks you as experts on the subject to work with them to moderate the laws of the country. You can't do that. It's a gag rule, because it gags people. And this is what happened in this one country the last time it was imposed, it was by George W. Bush. Congress has been silent on the subject, so Reagan, the two Bushes, and Trump have put it on. Clinton and Obama took the gag rule off. The last time, 60 health workers were laid off, clinics were shut down, so forth. Obama takes office, maternal mortality falls by a third. In fact, if you were seeking to design a policy that would increase unplanned pregnancy, increase abortions, increase unsafe abortions, and increase the death of women as a consequence of that, this is the policy you would come up with. This was a research that was done by some professors at Stanford. It showed what happened with abortion rates in sub-Saharan countries after that dotted line the last time the gag rule was put in place because so many services were curtailed because family planning groups could not in good conscience accept all these restrictions that the abortion rate soared. It soared. And, and this coming from 
uh, a president who, you know, used the phrase pro-life to describe himself. Uh, and now it's happening again. Sadly, if that weren't bad enough, and incidentally, Trump's gag rule is wider than any gag rule has ever been before. In the past, you lost family planning funding if you didn't comply with it. Now, organizations that work with malaria and HIV AIDS and other things are going to lose their funding as well. So it's, it's, it's not so much worse as it is wider, much wider, more than about 12 times as wide. It's going to cause incredible suffering for hundreds of thousands, even millions of people. In addition to that, several weeks ago, the Trump administration eliminated all funding for UN family planning. We send assistance bilaterally, country to country, but we also channel assistance to the UN. That's now been eliminated, and it's been eliminated, again, because Congress hasn't prevented its elimination, and further, because the Trump administration claimed that the UN was working in China, uh, ostensibly because it participates in a program of coercive abortion, and so forth. That's not true. The UN works in 151 countries. China is one of them. But what the UN has consistently done, and no one has ever provided a shred of evidence to suggest otherwise, is to persuade, work to persuade the Chinese government to use positive voluntary methods that respect and empower women, as opposed to the methods they have used, which have been egregious violations of human rights in many instances. So it's just not true. It's just not true. I want to show you another, also very brief video done by a, a former staff person, if I can, oh, it didn't, maybe, or maybe I won't, there it is, who now lives in Jordan. But I mean, problems <laughs> are always facing خاف أو عصب يصير معي ضيقة نفس ويعني يصير معي ضيقة نفس أدوخ يعني ما أحس بشيء كيف يعني عايشين مع بعضنا يعني يشوفون الولاد مثلا مكتبة أكيد راح أأثر عليهم قبل قبل ما أجي لهان يعني كان وضع سيء للغاية على طول الضجة بس لما أجيت لعندهم لهون وصار أستاذ عبد الله يعطيني إرشاد النفسي ارتحت كثير يعني لأن الدكتورة والنسائية موجودة الحمد لله We've had the forethought to take all of the funding that we've received from other resources and allocate it to protect the Madaba Center and ones that are similar that have a high uh, number of Syrian refugees and who would have no access otherwise. But as we go towards the end of the year, UNFPA is going to have to uh, triage between either closing centers uh, to keep ones like Madaba open a reduction in the number and type of services. Neither one of those is uh, an option that UNFPA hopes we'll ever have to realize. يعني لو المركز مو موجود أكيد يعني ما كنت راح استفاد شيء. يعني كنت ضليت يعني نفسيتي كانت كثير تعبانة. So that's what's going on. Last year, our support for the UN accomplished these goals. I won't read them. Pretty impressive, though. Pretty important. Going forward, here's what's going to happen. It's going to go to zero. It's going to go to zero. And uh, given all the other crises around the world, I don't see how this gap is going to be made up for people like Sultana in that refugee camp and for millions of others as well. So that's sort of the current events, and I'll return to that at the end. When you look at the connections between population growth and the environment, they're, they're, they're everywhere. Uh, even on the remote 
uh, Midway Island, which is about as far as you can get from anything in this country, at least in this world, anything uh, in terms of human impact, you would think. But it's a nesting ground, Midway Island is, for the albatross. Uh, thousands make their nests there, uh, raise their young. They fly out over the Pacific, over an area called the vast area, depending on who you believe, it's the size of Texas or, or maybe twice the size of the continental United States. It's an area where, because of tidal currents, uh, garbage collects. Most of it, parts of it look like this, but most of it's more like a garbage soup, little particles of plastic floating in the water. Uh, these birds go out there, they spy what they think is food, they pick it up, they take it back to their nestlings. A third of the albatross nestlings die from plastic ingestion. 90% uh, of all ocean-going seabirds now have plastic in their gut. There is a saying in recycling, there is no a way to throw anything. And this is evidence of it. There's just nowhere you can run to, nowhere you can hide in this regard. I particularly like this quote for three reasons. One. Uh, because it doesn't mince words. When you call something a plague, that's pretty darn strong. Uh, and it talks about how it's solvable. We know how to fix this. It's not that we lack knowledge, it's that we lack consciousness, which almost seem like the same thing. But as I say to students, uh, and perhaps some of you have similar memories, I can vaguely remember being a student, and I remember I had knowledge of when term papers were due long before I had consciousness of when they were due. And my transcript so reflects. So how do you go from knowledge to consciousness? And that's the third reason I like this quote, because those are the words of Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Dr. King understood that overpopulation, like so many other challenges, falls heaviest on those who often lack the resources to deal with it. And he also, in an extraordinary way, understood how to move people from knowledge to consciousness. I am just old enough to remember traveling through the Deep South or the South with my parents and, and seeing the colored only bathroom signs. Uh, and that's not to let the rest of the country off the hook, nor is it to suggest racism is a thing of the past. But certainly we have moved some distance between then and now. And we moved not through, excuse me, not through inertia, but rather through the good works and the efforts of people, uh, especially Dr. King and others. So my goal in my own very modest way is to try to move people from knowledge to consciousness to action on this issue, which is an issue Dr. King recognized as being very important. So I'm going to talk about family planning, and I've given hundreds of talks. I'm actually up to 79 colleges and universities. I'll be at Santa Monica College later this week, so I, I'm going to find out if life really does begin at 80 in terms of places I speak. We shall see. Uh, and I hope it does. Anyway. I, I've heard the, I can feel the air sometimes go out of the room when I mention family planning because it seems for many people so commonplace. It's sort of like talking about dental hygiene or proper footwear or something. And, and, and that's great if, if it were that way for everyone. And I use this super cheesy stock photo of the very nice pharmacy lady showing the other very nice lady her options because that's the way it should be. It should be just, oh yeah, I got to stop at the CVS by Wednesday kind of thing. But it isn't. It isn't for many women in the United States, and it isn't for hundreds of millions of women around the world. For hundreds of millions, they face a situation similar to these two young women who are two of the four wives of an impoverished bricklayer in Nigeria. Between them, these four women have already have 17 living children. For, for them, family planning is nothing less than a life and death matter. They face barriers. And everything I've learned in the 20 years I've been working on this tells me that 100%, not 99, not 99.99, .99, but 100% of this issue in dealing with population growth is about removing barriers. The way you transform the trajectory of population growth on this planet is by changing the trajectory of the lives of women and girls and couples. And you do that not by lecturing them. You do that by removing the barriers that prevent them from achieving their own desired goals. And I'll show you evidence, I hope, too, that I hope supports that. It certainly seems to to me. We were kind of a slow starter as a species. Uh, it took, depending on how you measure the onset of home, the, the appearance of Homo sapiens, maybe 160,000 years to get to one billion people. Today we add a billion every dozen years. Imagine that, 160,000 to get to the first billion. We add a billion every dozen years or so now. 
And as you can see, it, it, human population growth took off like a rocket around 1800. And the reason that happened wasn't because people started having bigger families. That's not the case at all. It happened because of the most miraculous event in human history, which is child survival. Children began to survive their early years. Back 200 years ago, a woman might have seven children typically, but only two or three would make it to the age of five in a typical family. And it was the rudiments of modern medicine, really modern public health, sanitation, that transformed that. But even great news can have consequences. I mean, if you win, I don't care about you, if I win the lottery, uh, I will discover I have a lot more cousins than I knew I had. You know, all of a sudden, my, I won't have to need a genealogist to, to fill out the family tree. The, f the phone tree will do it. So we're now growing. We're adding a billion people every dozen years or so. The reason it tops out there in 2100 is not because that's what demographers anticipate. It's because there's no data beyond that point. You would have to know how many children, how many great grandchildren and great great grandchildren people in college today are going to have to make any kind of reasoned hypothesis or projection beyond 2100. So generally, there's not much point in looking beyond that because you just can't come up with numbers. We have made extraordinary progress, even as the problem has gotten worse. It's kind of a strange thing. It's, it's much better and much worse than it used to be. When we were founded in 1968, there were four countries on Earth at or below replacement rate. Essentially, a couple has two children. That's so it's slightly above two because, sadly, infant mortality is never zero. But a couple having two kids is replacement rate. There were four countries in 1968, I'm not claiming credit for this next development, but I'm pointing out there are now 98. That's pretty significant progress in about two human generations. All those countries shown in green are places where people have two children or fewer on average. Yellow between two and three, red between three and more than seven. And seven seems to be the biological limit within a society for a variety of reasons. Sure, you'll find somebody with 15 or 17 children, but that's, that's the outlier. You never really find a society with fertility rates above a little over seven. So you can see these enormous and vast disparities around the world. And the impact of this rapid human population growth is extraordinary. We are in a period of species extinction, the likes of which our species has never seen. There are thousands, at a minimum, thousands of plant and animal species that are threatened and endangered. This is probably not one of them. I say that because the Yangtze River dolphin, the Baiji, has been around for 20 million years. A century ago, there were between three and 5,000 of them. As near as anybody can tell, it's now extinct. Biologists can't find any, but you can't prove a negative. There may be a pot or two of them somewhere. Pollution killed them off, and we know what species is driving that. And it's not just pollution. It can be forest fragmentation, introduction of invasive species, changes in climate. All sorts of things can cause overhunting, overfishing. All sorts of things can cause extinction. But we know which species is behind it in virtually every instance. The other thing that's happening, and this may seem like a strange thing to say, is time is changing. Here's what I mean by that. Uh, if you went back to the mid-1700s and you imagined a rainy day in northern Minnesota, the water, the rain that fell that day is only now, on average, reaching the Atlantic Ocean. It takes that long for water to traverse the five Great Lakes go up the St. Lawrence Seaway and reach the Atlantic. That's ecological time. We're now living in human time. This is the Aral, A-R-A-L-C, a freshwater body in Asia. The composite photograph on the left, about 25 years ago, it was the fourth largest lake in the world. Look what happened in just 25 years as the lake was drawn down for, for drinking water and for agricultural use. There are efforts at reclamation now, but it's hard to say that they're going to be a success. It's an extraordinary development. Things are happening at a speed we've never really seen during our time as a species. And the links between population growth and fossil fuel emissions are pretty extraordinary. Uh, you know, if you look back 20 centuries, you can see these two trend lines track. Paul Hawken just came out with a new book called Drawdown, where he ranked the 100 most 
things that could be done to transform uh, climate change and reduce it. I have to put an asterisk after this, but Paul Hawken ranked, after talking to a lot of scientists, he ranked population growth as number one. It's actually not number one on his list because for reasons that I don't quite grasp, he split it into two pieces between contraception and girls' education, which I think are both important, but I, I'm not quite sure why he did that and with that and not with anything else. Otherwise, it would have been number one. I, I don't mean to cast aspersions on his methods, but it seems puzzling to me that, that uh, often when people talk about climate, and I don't want to pick on Paul Hawken, I'm just saying in general, they shy away from talking about population growth even though there's abundant evidence that it's a number one driver in terms of climate change. There's something about it that makes people feel like we can't say it because it's, well, it's an inconvenient truth, to borrow a phrase. So that's what's happening. Now, how many people can the Earth support? Well, for example, if we all, all us humans, moved today to Los Angeles, all of us, LA County, we can all fit into Los Angeles County. This is what it would look like. I don't know what happens if one of those people up in the top right hand corner gets thirsty or this person down here needs to use the bathroom or gets hungry. It all kind of falls apart quickly. I, all, I sometimes hear people say, well, when you fly across the United States and look down, you see a lot of empty land. And I say, it's not empty. It's got lakes and trees and bears and, you know, and turtles and all kinds of stuff in it. It's not empty. It's, it's, it's ecologically full of all kinds of things that enable us to have, to exist, to put it bluntly. So how many people can the Earth support? Well, Joel Cohen, a great demographer, wrote a book by that title, and after studying it, he came to some interesting conclusions. The main conclusion he came to is you can't put a number on it, no matter how hard you try. You just can't. And I've seen people try like crazy to put a number on it. Because it depends on two things. One, how do you want to live? Two, how do you want everybody else to live? And, and, and not just people. There's other critters that we share this planet with. And there are people and critters who haven't gotten there yet. So these are ethical questions. And you can't find, spreadsheets are great, but they're not great places to find ethical answers. You should have to look elsewhere. Yes, you should know the numbers, but you need to know more. Now, there are 7.5 billion of us on the planet. If we all wanted to live like this, based on current resource production, we could all have the same lifestyle that the poorest people do in East Africa, a daily search for survival that often ends in failure. Now, I don't want to live that way. I hate the, other, the idea others have to. But the fact is that there's plenty of room for more if that's the way we want to live, and, and I don't think we do. The UN does good work on this. They point out that we have 7.5 billion of us. Every couple of years, they do projections. They do 100,000 data runs in every country. Right now, they're anticipating by the end of the century, we'll add 4 billion, we'll be at about 11.2 billion. A dozen years earlier, when the UN did the same exercise through 2100, they said there'd be 9 billion of us. They've added 2.2 billion to their projection. The reason is, and it's not the fault of the demographers, they are prisoners of data, it's because magical thinking has gotten in the way. People just think that somehow, that's a really bad way to pay off your mortgage, by the way. It just doesn't work. Magical thinking, it doesn't work for much in life. So, well, so one way or another, magical thinking is a big problem. That's why they've added 2.2 billion, because people just sort of thought things would happen automatically, and they haven't. Now, that purple line is how many people there will be on the planet at the end of this century if family size stays the same everywhere as it is today. Nobody expects that, but the UN gives us that data so that we know what it would be. The green and blue lines are what if lines. What if every woman on Earth had one half child, on average, more or fewer? It shows what very small differences can make an extraordinary difference. Now, I know people who are really worried about that blue line down there. They think we're going to have a people shortage. <laughs> but by the way, whenever I'm, and it would work up here on the 101, but I, whenever I'm in Los Angeles, I always explain away that argument by saying three numbers, 405. <laughs> There's no people shortage on the 405. But 
let's, let's just give these people their due and imagine some distant future, distant, distant future, millennia from now, if that trend were to continue, maybe there would be a people shortage. Maybe we should leave a giant pictograph somewhere showing people how they can get more people if they need them, uh, in case they've forgotten. But which of these trajectories we're going to follow is going to depend on what we do. And if we remove those barriers that I'm going to talk about, we can move to a much better situation. We could stabilize human population and begin a slow decline within a relatively short period of time. So what do we say to a woman in, say, sub, in sub-Saharan Africa who is having maybe seven children on average? And I don't like to use poverty porn pictures. I, I'd rather use pictures that uplift and, and inspire. Well, she does not need a lecture. She doesn't need anybody wagging her finger at her and telling her what to do. Uh, nor does she need to be told to care more about her family. She cares as much as anybody ever could. What she needs is to have those barriers removed. So let me give you an example of a remote, faraway place where this happened, the United States. Back in the mid-50s, women had almost 3.7 children each. Within a single generation, it dropped by almost 50%. That red line just above two is that replacement rate line I mentioned. We've been at or below replacement rate now for more than 40 years. How did this happen? What, what ha that's, off, that's incredibly fast. I mean, when you think about it, that's a pretty sharp decline. So here are six possibilities. They could all be right or wrong. Did we have a famine? Did we have a dictatorship? We're, eh, not yet. We're, was it number three? It's all Johnny Carson's fault. No, I don't think people stopped having sex until Netflix came along. That's when it all ended. Uh, maybe not quite, though. It was the bottom three, wasn't it? Increased education of women. And that's when women as a gender went to college in great numbers. And look at what happened as a consequence. When women have more options, they often choose to have smaller families. They also have ch children later in life which can make a huge difference. It can even matter more than how many they have. Birth control pill, which is actually technology, isn't it? That's what birth control pills are. Now, the early pills were 100 times stronger than today's pills. There are now a variety of methods. I will note that male contraception still lags badly, and that's a shame, and more than a shame, it's an embarrassment. As a young woman said at a program I was at a while ago, if men could get pregnant, birth control pills would be free and bacon flavored. You know, <laughs> you know just be no question about it. Uh, by the way, Bill and Melinda Gates are investing their money now in, in male contraceptive research, so hopefully we'll see something within a, within a few years, but not yet. My hunch is that even if we had an incredibly effective male contraceptive, most women would still like to be, if you will, in the driver's seat because the men don't carry the pregnancy. It's just as simple as that. Changes in laws, basically the Supreme Court ruled in favor of contraception and in a more complex and arguably more controversial way around abortion, all of which is based on the notion of a right to privacy, uh, which if you don't believe it's in the Constitution, check out the Ninth Amendment, which says the list of rights here isn't the whole list. Madison insisted on the Ninth Amendment because the notion of a right to privacy predates our Constitution and, in fact, was well understood by, in a different context, certainly, but was well understood by the framers. So that's how this happened. Extraordinary change. Now, how about Mexico? How many children does the average, does anybody want to hazard a guess? How many children? Yes. 4.6. It was 4.6 along the way. They've dropped since 1970 from 6.7 to 2.2. They are that much above replacement rate right now, one-tenth of one percent. It happened for three reasons. One, well, more than three, but three key reasons. One, literacy programs for men and women, education. Two, good sex ed. Three, family planning. Now, Mexico is a heavily Catholic country. But they have, you know how country, these other countries, they're so weird. They have this idea of the separation of church and state down there. It's just really strange. It hasn't <laughs> caught on everywhere yet, apparently. But we actually helped Mexico along the way with providing funds for family planning. We don't help Mexico anymore because they don't need, we were a good neighbor. They don't need the help anymore. That's an extraordinary change. It's also surprising to people 
that today, looking back over the last six years, the United States has zero, let me repeat that, zero net undocumented immigration. Zero. Zero. Uh, I'm not sure what that Taj Mahal wall will do since as many people who have come here without documentation leave as arrive. But, and a lot of that, not entirely, but a lot of that is due to changes in Mexico, which are also due to multiple factors, but certainly smaller families has played a very key role and will continue to. But again, as I mentioned, the problem is far from resolved around the world. And you can see that particularly in Africa and parts of Asia and parts of Central and South America, there are still great challenges. There are, in fact, 225 million women around the world with an unmet need for contraception. That means that they would use, they, they, they are pregnant, don't want to be pregnant, but aren't using contraception. So they face barriers. Before I got familiar with this issue, I would have said or guessed that the number one barrier is probably they haven't heard of it or they couldn't afford it. It isn't. The number one barrier, 25% of women in this situation in developing countries, report that it's fear of side effects. That's the number one barrier. Either because the woman walked three hours to a clinic, there was only one method available and it was a problem for her, but there were no other choices, or because she's been fed deliberately or otherwise a steady diet of misinformation. It's going to make her sterile, etc. You can't solve that problem by flying a cargo plane over a country and pushing bales of IUDs out unless they hit somebody on the head and maybe you've reduced the population by one. You actually have to get in on the ground, build trust, build respect, take your time, understand the culture, and then you can change things. And we know that because it's being done all over the world. It's extraordinary what would happen, and these are real world examples, not some vague hypothetical. Extraordinary the impact that this would have. It's not free. Shocking. It costs $25 per woman per year. About 10 or 11 of that dollars are for the actual methods themselves. The rest are for the programs that I described. You've got to provide this in the context of reproductive health services and good communication and respect. Do the math, 225 million times 25, you come up north of $6 billion. That is the global annual gap. It's a big number. Let me put it in context. Apple, ever heard of them? Apple is sitting on about $220 billion worth of cash right now. My hunch is that if they have it all piled up somewhere, we could just go, look at that cardinal, and psh, grab $6 billion. Who could even tell? Who could tell the difference between a pile of $220 billion and $214? But my point is that it's affordable within the global context if we had the will to do it. We have the wallet. It's just that there's a lock on it, a lot of locks. I'm not picking on Apple. I'm just using that as an example to show that there's enough money in the world to address this out there. The United States, until recently, this was last year's figures, going into this current administration, was providing about $600 million a year, largest funder internationally for family planning. We're not the only one. This is what we did with our tax dollars. By the way, if you're a typical American, that costs you a nickel a week. I think it's a pretty good investment for a nickel a week. Uh, to do all of this as, as we do it collectively and as a group. Unfortunately, it's under assault. The money to the UN has already been cut off. The global gag rule is essentially going to ensure that most, many, probably most of the most effective family planning organizations around the world will no longer get the money. And it's going to go to organizations, in many cases, that are not effective. Organizations, for example, that promote natural family planning, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing, except for the tiny problem that it doesn't work. Other than that, it's like a great, a great vehicle. It just doesn't go anywhere. Well, it does. It's the problem. It goes in the wrong direction. So we're seeing this assault right now on these programs. And we know who's in a position to do something about it. The 535 men and women at this end of Pennsylvania Avenue and the one gentleman at the other end of the avenue. One of the, one of the things you hear when it comes to foreign aid and family planning is a form of foreign aid. Well, we're broke. We owe, 20, we owe $19 trillion. That's our national debt. 
Well, who do you think we owe the biggest share to? Anybody want to venture a guess? China. That's right. The gentleman here in row three, we owe most of it to us. Two-thirds of our national debt is owed to us. Now, I guess if we don't pay ourselves back, we could hire somebody to go break our kneecaps. You know, we're doing it ourselves. We don't even need to pay anybody. But I think we're good people. I think we'll do it. I, you know, we've loaned money to ourselves for crazy things like education and child nutrition and, and a few other things that are not quite as good, admittedly. But we owe most of this money to ourselves. The second circle is China. And I actually think there's an argument to be made that owing them a little money, whether that's a little or not, it's another question, is not a bad thing. I mean, if you were to loan somebody $500, you kind of want them to do well, don't you? You don't want them to come back and say, I'm so sorry, but I'm never going to have that money. I'll never get another job. You're, you're just out. That's all. There's nothing here. You kind of having them a little invested in our economic welfare, maybe in our, in our national interest, arguably. But most of it's owed to ourselves. The public also vastly overestimates the amount of the federal budget that goes for foreign aid. It's 1% of the federal budget. The average person thinks it's 26%. People aren't stupid. If my air conditioner breaks, I want somebody who knows how to fix it to come out. Uh, she or he may know a lot about air conditioning and not much about foreign aid, but this lack of information gets in the way. And incidentally, family planning is 1% of the 1% of foreign aid, but it's all under great assault right now. So I kind of come back to where I started out, that these are life and death questions. And if we can, we can invest modest amounts relative to the world, modest amounts in good programs without ridiculous rules, we can transform people's lives. We started a campaign early this year focused uh, primarily initially on college campuses. We started in six states, Arizona, Colorado, Pennsylvania, Ohio, New Hampshire and North Carolina, uh, where we worked with college students and we had organizers on campuses. Uh, it went, the, the response was just incredible. I'll give you one example. Uh, we did a teach-in at Ohio State and you know, you do that kind of thing, you get, hey, 80 students showed up, that's great. We had over a thousand, over a thousand students show up on International Women's Day to be part of this. A lot of this is what people call DIY efforts, do it yourself. We tried to inspire students to come up with their own ideas. Some students did a 47-minute silent protest or silent memorial, if you will, to reflect the 47,000 women who die every year from unsafe abortion. Different students did different things. We also brought about 350 of the best and brightest students to Washington for a program. And I want to show you a very brief, about a minute and a half long item about that program we did. <clears throat> Oops, I hit the wrong button. While many people are feeling down about the current political environment, some Arizona State students are getting more fired up about political advocacy. Reporter Anthony Marroquin met today with a group in Washington to see what they're doing to get involved and make a change. Daniel Restrepo says growing up under the Obama administration may have made him a little complacent with the political system, but that he's ready to make a change. I was kind of horrified, and so I kind of realized that was where I needed to step up and do my part where I hadn't been in the past. He was one of over 300 other advocates in Washington this weekend for a workshop sponsored by Population Connection. Absolutely. We say hi. Um, we are constituents. We are all Arizona State University students, and we are speaking on behalf of Population Connection. This morning, Arizona Arizona State University students took to Capitol Hill to talk to their elected officials about an executive order passed in January which takes funding away from international groups that mention abortion. Not too many people really like dive in on what exactly needs to happen for reproductive rights so somebody's got to stand up so why not us? But that wasn't the only thing they were looking to accomplish. To take these materials and take information back home to better enable us to act in our own communities and in our own towns and cities. And even more, to show that this is not an issue that they're willing to step back from. If it is coming out to the Capitol to physically be here and physically speak to them and knock on their own office doors, we will be that generation, we will be that crowd of people, we will be those activists that's larger than just an issue. We intend to be a movement. In Washington, Anthony Marroquin, Cronkite News. 
you know, I, I started with the story about Lisa, who was uh, lying on that sofa that day. And I'll kind of wrap it up with Haley, uh, who I think said it well. Somebody's got to stand up, so why not us? I am so impressed with the thousands of young people I've met on campuses. They really care. They want to do something. Uh, and thankfully, they, they're not burdened by kind of all the rationale for why you can't do things. They're just determined to make it happen. And their energy level, their enthusiasm is just extraordinary. And we're able to work with them because of the 40,000 donors, members, friends, really, who are kind enough. I, I say at the office, it's the miracle of the envelopes. I don't understand it. But every day, people are kind enough to support our work. And so that's what we're able to do. We're able to reach thousands of students and others as well, more and more, uh, to try to provide a better pathway for this world. Uh, and most of you, uh, you feel free if you didn't sign the sheet, but you're suddenly inspired, you can also text us at that number. Uh, I will just wrap up, and then we'll have a little time for some questions and comments. By saying population growth is a challenge that, about which three key things are true. One, we know how to meet it. We know where babies come from. There's been field work done. We've pretty well figured that out. And modern contraception is pretty effective. Number two, it's not wildly expensive. You saw the numbers. And number three, when you remove the barriers and enable women and girls and couples to fulfill their own destinies, First of all, it's just good in and of itself, even if it had no impact on population growth. But in country after country on every inhabited continent, you see population growth rates plummet when that happens. So we know how to fix it. We just face some pretty significant barriers today, and those barriers did get higher on November 8th. But hopefully we can get past that and get back to the business of transforming the world. Thank you. Uh, I was told to say to whoever wanted to make questions or comments that they should talk into the microphone. Maybe somebody can I'll, be... I'll pass the microphone okay. around, and uh, please don't say anything until you have it, uh, have the microphone. The CIA mic will pick it up, but ours won't. So. It seems to me that uh, the biggest source of pollution comes from people driving cars in countries where, whose population growth is, is about even. My concern with uh, talks like you've just given is that oftentimes it's, it tends to be white people sneering at brown and, and yellow people for the problems of uh, environmental pollution. I'd like you to address that. Right. Well, my old answer used to be that's next week's speaker, but I've discovered that didn't satisfy people as an answer. Uh, it's an old Ted Kennedy line. but. Uh, we are certainly, when, it, when you look, for example, you look at climate change, uh, the places that tend to have the very large families tend to have very low levels of fossil fuel emissions and vice versa. So there's no question in terms of uh, when you look at pollution by, by most metrics, by most metrics, it's those of us in, in more affluent, high consumption countries that are the bigger part of the problem. Uh, the fact is, though, that it's not, we're not at a point where we have the luxury of either or. We've got to kind of do both and. Uh, I don't blame people in other countries for anything. Uh, I think that what we're trying to do is to respond, for example, in terms of foreign aid, we cannot go into any country with foreign aid unless we're invited in by that country. So at least the leadership of that country has to feel that they would like programs to address population growth. Uh, if they don't want us there, we don't go there. And the key with this is never, ever, ever trying to come in with a number in mind or try to tell people to have smaller families. And some of our members would kind of like us to do that. It's, again, about removing barriers that prevent people from doing what they want to do. Uh, now, let's, let's understand what would happen if that magically happened overnight. Magically, uh, standards of living would rise suddenly around the world, and by any reasonable measure, uh, many environmental in indicators would actually get worse because people would have more resources. But I don't think we can ethically say the solution to this problem is to make sure that half the world stays desperately poor. That just strikes me as a both ethical and practical improbability. 
So it's a question of going where we're asked to go and, and providing the kind of voluntary programs that most people in this country have access to so that people can make their own choices. I have a couple of comments to make. Yeah. It has maybe nothing to do with this, but first off, what do you think of this idea of sending the most dangerous animal on our planet to another planet? <laughs> That's ridiculous. Talk, are you not, are you, oh, oh uh, you're referring to humans, not one yes, particular. Yes, humans. I didn't know there was an effort to uh, yeah. send, send the president on a somewhat more remote trip. <laughs> I, 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 the, uh, uh, I, I don't know. I, I, I did worry. I remember, gosh, it was a couple of generations ago, we sent this disc out in distant space where it showed exactly where we were. Mm -hmm. And some, some people said, you know, if there's some, some creatures traveling through space and they've gotten hungry, it might be sort of like those highway notices that tell you there's a restaurant over here. Uh, you know, that, that there's some carbon-based uh, life forms. Uh, I don't know. I, I think that, uh, you know, there's, uh, uh, you know, somebody once said, uh, is there intelligent life on other planets? I'm not sure there's any here some days, so. Well, then another point I made, the great... Uh, scholar Eucalyptus said, penis erectus non consciensis, or a stiff prick has no conscience. Well, well. That's one of the problems. Well, you know what? Thirdly, it, it, thirdly it, it, yeah. my solution to this is to give a free vasectomy to every kid getting his driver's license. <laughs> <laughs> I have long, I, it took me a long time to learn that some comments should just be allowed to stand as they are and breathe free, so, so it took me a long time to learn that, so I will let your, I will, I will let, let people ponder that in its, in its uh, essence. Okay. Thank you for coming today and talking. This is the first time I've come and I came just to hear you speak. Um, one, one of the things that comes up for me, uh, well, talking about vasectomies, first of all, there's a documentary about Dr. Douglas Stein, the vasectomist, who has gone around the world giving free vasectomies and actually gave 1,000 vasectomies in one day as a world record. And if you can see that documentary, it's wonderful. Um. I would rather have been number one than num than number thousand. I'm just, just, and I'm not suggesting otherwise. But I just one more. I can just do one more. Quick, get over here. Anyway, well, go ahead. The th right. thing is, I am a registered nurse, yeah. and I mm -hmm. have had the opportunity to be standby assist in in vasectomies. It's an extremely easy procedure. It's probably easier than taking a mole off of well. And maybe a little bit more complicated taking a mole off a piece of your skin right. um, and compared to what happens when you have a hysterectomy. Um, and you said that um, also the, there is a Chinese reaction, an oppositional reaction almost to the, fam the negative family planning that they did in China. Um, I know a woman who was a Chinese woman who was involved in that and she's gotten so much on the other side that she's actually attacking and saying that all birth control is bad for women. So, um, and then the third comment I had was um, there was I think a countywide read for Santa Clara County of A Memory of Water, which talks about the water issues. People fly out over, I fly back to Colorado where I'm from, and it's dry. They, nothing can really live out there, and humans can't, and like you were saying, do we want to live in Sierra conditions? And it's, it's a water issue. Even here in California, how many people can we have here and still have green grass? So. Thank you for coming. You raise, you raise a lot of good points. I'll mention that uh, there definitely needs to be vasectomies indeed are, uh, as is clinically, uh, clinical abortion, a very safe, for example, abortions done under proper clinical conditions are 20 times safer for the woman than a colonoscopy. So that, yeah. There are long-term um, issues with can, abortion. I'm sorry. There are long-term issues with um, having abortions, and I'm not anti-abortion. I am pro-choice, pro-life, 
And um, but what happens is to a woman's cervix is it gets scarred, and their later attempts to have an actual pregnancy might be impacted in being able to hold a pregnancy. But that can be addressed. So it's abortion is not without its complications for women later, and it's more a repeated abortions that become more scarring to the cervix. So. Yeah, our, the chairman of our board, Joe Spidell, is uh, uh, M M D M P H uh, O B G Y N is at UCSF. And I asked Joe one day, I said, you're an you're a, uh, OBGYN. In the history of the world, has any woman ever had an abortion who wasn't pregnant? And he said, no, that has never happened. And I say that not to make light of it, but just to point to the importance of good contraception. One of the interesting things, and I won't try to address all of the very many questions you raised, or points you raised, because I think they were all good and interesting. I'll mention that uh, today, and again, there is no one birth control method that's right for everyone, but uh, there are now implants that some women elect to have in their upper arm, about the size of a, uh, a, a, a match toothpick stick. and matchstick. Uh, they are about 200 times more effective than birth control pills in typical use. They are more effective, and this is really amazing, than vasectomies or tubal ligation in terms of pregnancy rates. Out of 10,000 women in typical use, 900 will get pregnant in a year using birth control pills. Five will get pregnant using implants. So there's been some really extraordinary progress around this. And of course, we see what happens when family planning programs are curtailed, as they were by Bush and now by Trump. We're going to see abortion rates go up. You, you had a question? Hi, my name is Nirmal Iyengar, and uh, I'm reading a book by this author called uh, Closer. Okay, I'm reading a book by the author uh, called Hariri. That's his last name, and he makes a comment. He says most of the problems these days are global, and administration is local or controls are local, right. which I kind of agree with. And uh, in, in in a way, it's good because the world is becoming one. We're finally coming to a, a globalized. Uh, view of the world. The second thing is, uh, there's a lot of emphasis on 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 what I call uh, symptoms. Uh, a lot of what we s see from the issues that are important to us over here, such as climate change and and uh, and population, are resource allocation uh, in the world. And so I don't see any sort of interest in changing the economic model or the paradigm under which we create these inequalities. Uh, any thoughts on that? Uh, well, I, 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 not to be flippant at all, I, I wish we would. Uh, I will say this, that, that there, are, there are multiple causes for almost everything in, in life, uh, unless you're standing in front of a truck that comes at you at 60 miles an hour, then you're, it's kind of a single cause for what happens next. We put together a book a couple of years ago, which is available on our website, popconnect.org, as a free download. And essentially, it sought to debunk, using scholarly essays, the notion that that a society, and we're looking at the United States, needs population growth to have a healthy economy. Even leaving aside the idea of what makes an economy healthy. I mean, you could, you know, the book starts to get this thick when you get into that. What we looked at specifically was what, what makes an economy productive. And we realized that productivity can have its own challenges. And essentially, the thesis, which came from a, a guy at Harvard named David Bloom, is that in order to have a productive economy, you have to have a productive workforce. In order to have a productive workforce, there are three key factors. One, you need a healthy workforce. Two, you need a well-educated workforce. And three, you need workplaces that are sufficiently flexible to take advantage of all the different skills and life circumstances that people find themselves in and have. And that that isn't, you don't resolve that through population growth. You resolve that through investing in great education, great health care, and, and providing encouragement and incentives uh, for more flexible workplaces. I'll just give you one of infinite number of examples. Germany, in BMW in Germany found that its older production line workers were not as productive as its younger production line workers. But then they looked at why. They made two changes. One, they switched to wooden floors rather than concrete floors, easier on the knees. Two, they put in magnification equipment. 
all of a sudden, the older workers were just as productive as the younger workers. The head of Deutsche Bank said, young people run faster, but old people know all the shortcuts. <laughs> so, so there's more than one way to win the race. But uh, maybe we have time for one or two more questions. I noticed on your chart that the red countries were almost always Islamic. What do you have to say about this uh, extraordinary barrier? Um, it, is, it, it, it is certainly more commonly the case. Uh, but within the Islamic world, for example, you have as much variation as you do within, uh, within countries that are predominantly Christian. Case in point, Iran. Iran has one of the most progressive family planning programs in the world. In 16 years, they went from 6.5 children to two. And they did it through family planning, through sex ed, uh, through just good, good programs, through education of women. So within the Islamic world, you'll find as many variations as you will within, say, the Christian world. Uh, if you want to think of it that way. If you look at Nigeria, for example, and my chart was just a country by country or a big picture depiction, part of Nigeria is Christian, part of it predominantly, and part of it is predominantly Muslim. The Christian areas have seen family size drop quite a bit. The secular Muslim areas have also seen family size come down quite a bit. The more traditional or, if you will, fundamentalist Muslim areas have not seen that shift. If you look along the northern tier of Africa, the Mediterranean nations, Algeria, Tunisia, uh, places like that, have actually seen dramatic changes in family size. If you were going to correlate it to anything, it correlates to other factors. Uh, but certainly, uh, traditional fundamentalist, I think the more common denominator is when you have a fundamentalist religious view, you have very large families. For example, in the United States, Protestants have bigger families than Catholics. Uh, and it's because, in no small measure, because of the evangelical right. Yep. So the evangelical right probably has more in common with, with uh, other fundamentalist faiths than it does with other folks. Um. As our population keeps on growing and we can see most of the future, I guess maybe phrase it another way. Nobody has talked about how we're going to feed all these people. And when we get into Africa, I'm fear for the wild population because they may be the only food source uh, that is going to be available in 30 or 40, 50 years. And so I would also like to think that if I had a magic wand and every human being just made two copies of themselves and we had that two per person or, and we had that die off, we'd, maybe our population would grow like our country here that's a little bit less than two. How many, in 100 years, 150 years, we probably could get down to what I think is the right population around three billion. Well, I, I may not be around to see it. I'll, I'll give you to your to your to your the p first point you raised, and maybe we'll do one more question after that and, and wrap it up. We work with an organization in Uganda called Conservation Through Public Health, which is run by a wonderful woman named Dr. Gladys Kalima Zikasuka, Dr. Gladys for short. She is an Ugandan who trained as a veterinarian at the Royal College in London, went back to her home country to try to save the mountain gorilla in the area of the Bwindi impenetrable forest. She discovered very quickly that there was no way to do that without transforming the lives of the villagers because the average desired family size in that area is 10 children. And so what would happen in families is several children would go to school and others would stay there just to kind of scare off the animals to keep the crops growing. So what she's done is she's begun family planning programs and education programs uh, in these communities. And also programs where, uh, where people can become eco-tourist guides rather than hunting the gorilla can show them you can make an even better living if you help protect their habitat and you get to tour. If one of our staff went over there to see the program, you have to actually have to pay $600 for a gorilla permit, which goes to preservation efforts so that you can go out and see them. So you can't really pull these things apart. A last comment about Dr. Gladys. She goes and, and recommends to families, and this is her own country, these are people that are, you know, have the same background as her, that they might want to consider just having four children. 
and somebody at a program we did said, but Dr. Gladys, why don't you suggest they consider just having two? She said, you can't go to somebody who's planning to have 10 and tell them just to have two. They'll laugh at you. You just have to kind of move down the line. And once they get accustomed to somewhat of a smaller number, then you kind of move to the next level. So you can't untie these things. They're all very much tied together. Incidentally, programs like hers, which are called PHE programs, Population Health Environment, tend to have to struggle for funding because they don't fit neatly into any box. They kind of bleed across the boxes or